Hello, everyone. Welcome to Urban Elephant Media's presentation of a webcast that will outline the key steps to creating an actionable and cost-effective decarbonization plan, whether it's for a small campus, an entire city, or a company with hundreds of facilities. My name is Randy Rogers of Urban Elephant Media. We provide sustainability training for civic leaders and professionals in all 50 states and around the world. Our sponsor today is CarbonSight by AutoCase, the economic lens for sustainable and resilient design. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the box provided in your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the program. Feel free to download the presentation slides from the handout section of your control panel at any time. A recording of this webcast will be available on Wednesday so we'll send you a link to that tomorrow. Our speakers today are Nicolette Sanfilippo, Director of Portfolio Sustainability Strategy at Stoke, and Simon Fowl, an economist and Director of Customer Success for Carbon Site at AutoCase. So now, Simon, go ahead and get started as soon as you're ready. Cool, thanks, Randy. And uh, yeah, hi, everybody. My name is Simon. I'm Director of Customer Success for, for Carbon Site, and for those of you who, who don't know what, what Carbon Site is, it's a, uh, a decarbonization road mapping tool for, for real estate. So we help uh, building owners organize, prioritize, and then visualize a, a decarbonization road, road map um, so that they can come up with a, a plan of action to hit greenhouse gas uh, reduction goals. And yeah, I'm really excited to be, be joined by, by Nicolette here, and I'll, I'll let her say hi. Hi everyone, my name is Nicolette Sanfilippo. Um, as Randy mentioned, I'm the Director of Portfolio Sustainability Strategy at Stoke. And for anyone who's unfamiliar with Stoke, we're a real estate and corporate strategy services firm focused on sustainability and we have offices in San Francisco, San Diego and Denver. Um, we offer ESG sustainability carbon consulting as well as ener energy engineering commissioning and corporate real estate and workplace strategy solutions. I've been at the company for over eight years and my work really focuses on developing and implementing sustainability programs for large scale corporate real estate portfolios. And I've worked with clients across many different sectors to customize decarbonization programs. So I'm excited to be here today and share some of the insights from my experience. Cool, thanks Nicolette. Um... And just before we dive in, there is a, a companion guide that goes along with, with this webinar. And you can, there's a couple of ways to, to get your hands on it. You can either go on the, the Carbon Site website, and if you just scroll down a little bit, you'll see this, this place to, to download it. And I think Randy has actually put it in the handout section of the, the webinar. So if you go into the, the GoToWebinar console bit, there should be the slides as well as this this PDF to, to download and it will have kind of a lot of the stuff that, that we're going to be covering here, but maybe a little additional detail because we can only cover so much in, in the time we have today. So be sure to, to download that. In terms of what we're going to cover for the agenda, um, these are the, the eight steps that we're going to be covering. And we're going to start with creating a business case for decarbonizing your real estate portfolio in the first place? What are the risks of not decarbonizing? We'll then cover the importance of, of baselining emissions and filling in, filling in data gaps. Step three is all about how to set the right kinds of, of carbon reduction targets. Step four is then thinking about what kinds of levers you can pull at the building level to reduce emissions. Step five is then how do you prioritize those measures to come up with a, a plan of action. Step six, implementing that, that plan. Step seven, we'll then talk a bit about how to effectively track and communicate both successes and failures. And then step eight is, is kind of a, a cheat step because you just go back to the beginning. But this is what we're going to cover. I'm probably going to be covering more of the theoretical side of things. And then what Nicolette, what I'm really excited about Nicolette bring into this conversation is her experience with clients doing this on the ground and bringing more of that practical side of, of what I'll be covering. So um, hopefully this will be a really valuable session for you all. 
So let's start off with step number one, which is really understanding the risks of not decarbonizing. I'm not really going to talk about kind of the, the climate crisis and real estate's role in that. I think most people on this call probably are aware of that and uh, understand kind of the, the scale of the problem that's facing us. But what I will touch on is more of the, uh, the key business drivers that are now creating um, real business reasons and flipping this question of, of what's the cost of decarbonizing on its head. And now people are asking what's the cost of not decarbonizing their real estate assets. So that's really, I think, what we want to cover in this first step is thinking about what are the, the five risks that are ultimately leading buildings to be less desirable and potentially less valuable if they are um, if they're, they're like high energy and high carbon intensity buildings. And so we're going to cover these risks one by one, starting with with regulatory risks. And so these are things like local local building energy performance standards. And these are things that I'm sure many of you are aware that local jurisdictions set either energy or carbon thresholds. And if, if buildings that are a certain criteria don't meet those thresholds, then there are fines or penalties that, that have to be paid. And I think there are more and more of these, these different regulations coming down the line. And it's not a question of, should you do it? It's more of a question, when will you have to, to do this? When will you have to create a plan to decarbonize your building so that you're not at risk of, of these penalties? And it's probably you know, a strategic move to do it sooner rather than later. The second big risk is around access to, to financing and investor pressure. So I think, you know, ESG reporting requirements are now um, becoming a bit more stringent where they want to show or they want people to show that there is actual meaningful action towards the goals that, that many people have set. And we're getting told by, by clients that they're getting investors calling them and saying, like, what are you doing to decarbonize your portfolio? And if, if you don't have a, a good answer backed with, with data um, to show your plan of action to decarbonize, then you know, that, that puts you at risk of, of losing access to, to financing. The third one is operational costs. And I think this is fairly straightforward. The energy prices are fluctuating, they're getting higher every year. Um, and so if you can save energy, you're saving money and you're saving carbon at the same time, most likely. Um, I think these retrofits, these these more like um, high performance energy retrofits require less maintenance as well. So there could be some operational cost savings that increase your NOI over time. You know, reputation is always a big one as well. And people have, have set these, these big lofty goals and you've got to now, um, Kind of put your money where your mouth is and, and show action towards these goals and reputation is on the line as well as the ability to attract and retain high quality tenants i think you know having a high performance building is is shown to to increase occupancy and retention which has a, a real financial value behind it and then lastly i want to just touch on resilience and business continuity risk um, I think we know that those relying on aging infrastructure are at greater risk of downtime from physical risks like you know, climate shocks. And so if you can invest in retrofits that improve that business continuity while also reducing your carbon emissions, then there's this um, two for one that you're getting. And so ultimately, yeah, there's these, these five business drivers that are really creating this brown discount. And I think what you should do is, is try and identify what risks impact each of your assets and the scale of those, those risks. I think that would be a, a good first step. But Nicolette, I'm curious to hear on your end, like what are clients talking to you about? What are the biggest risks that, that um, they're interested in? Yeah, I'm happy to weigh in on that. And I think I've seen every single one of these risks come up at some point or another with each client. 
But I would say the two that I'm hearing the most attention about, um, at least right now, is the regulatory risk and the reputational risk. So to the point you made, a lot of companies have establish these big lofty corporate sustainability commitments, science-based targets. A lot of their targets are approaching in 2030. And so as we're getting closer to that point in time, there's increasing pressure to hit interim targets along the way and be able to communicate that progress internally to investors, to the leadership team, to employees, and also to the public to preserve your reputation. And I think there's a lot of pressure as well from a competitor standpoint. Um, there's you know, always companies looking at what are their competitors doing and asking how they're doing compared to their competitors when it comes to meeting those um, sustainability goals. So that's a huge one. And mm -hmm. then the regulatory risk, I think we, you know, there's there's new laws coming into play that are impacting a large amount of companies. And we're all aware that the California bills 253 and 261, local law 97, and then the upcoming SEC climate disclosure rule are top of mind for a lot of companies that are now going to have to shift from doing this voluntarily to mandatory. Um, so I think that's that's making sustainability enter the leadership level at a much more pronounced scale than it was previously. And so decarbonization is, is getting a lot of traction due to that. Yeah, and those who probably are starting now have a, have a bit of a head start for when these, these things come down the line. So I imagine doing it sooner rather than later has probably put them in a, in a better position when, these, when they have to do it, I guess. Exactly. Um, yeah, well, that's super interesting and i think like part of these regulations are asking for being able to baseline emissions and and kind of quantify what that scope one two and three emissions are for, for where you are now and that is really what step number two is is all about it's kind of understanding where you are now in order to know what's feasible in terms of being able to to set targets so I think that's really the importance of, of baselining that that old adage of you can't manage what you don't measure is is really true here. And in order to really understand how much you're you're emitting, you need to conduct what's called either a, a greenhouse gas inventory or, or a carbon audit, which is really trying to understand how much carbon you are emitting across your your entire business um, operations and there's there's various protocols that you can you can follow I've put a few on the screen here and there's a few more in the the companion guide as well if you haven't downloaded it already in order to to conduct a GHG inventory you also have to um, organize your emissions into various scopes and the scope one two and three I am not going to cover all of this because you could do like an entire webinar series on probably like what goes into scope one versus scope two versus scope three. Um, so for the purpose of, of what we're going to be talking about, really it's scope one and two operational carbon emissions from building. So we're really looking at the carbon from energy use within within buildings that's what we're going to be focusing on okay so in order to you know get the understand or estimate the amount of carbon from your your energy use you obviously need to like find that energy data and that is easier said than done there's a few ways that you can do it and I've put like a little hierarchy on the screen here of what's maybe best practices um, in terms of the, the best quality data that you can find. Um, ideally, you want to be getting real energy data from utility bills or meter readings. That's like the, the number one tier, if you can get that. Um, but often that's, that's hard to come by. Um, so sometimes you can use the building specific ratio. So if you're occupying a building, maybe you're occupying like 10% of it and you know the building's entire energy use, you can maybe use that ratio of, of occupancy and apply that to, to your own emissions. Um, the third one here is, is then saying, well, maybe there are some similar buildings in your portfolio or that you know of in, in others. 
portfolios that you can extrapolate based on the type of building it is, where it's located, the, the occupancy schedule, things like that. And then lastly, there's the generic uh, building data. So maybe just finding a, a per square foot energy use out there from, from the market. So these are the four, four ways. And again, Nicolette, I'm very curious as to how like, you approach finding energy data. How do you fill the gaps? Um, who do you speak to within organizations to, to find this data? Yeah, and I, I actually love this graphic because before we even coordinated for this webinar, this is the exact hierarchy that I would explain to clients when you're starting off from the beginning trying to gather all your data. So the, the first thing you do, you want to move from the top of the pyramid down, obviously, and you need to start figuring out like, okay, in my portfolio, which sites have direct utility meters so we know that we can pull the actual consumption from the bills or if you've installed your own meter, say that you're the tenant of a large multi-tenant building, then you might have a meter installed that captures just your tenant space and it's not directly connected to the utility. So you wanna start talking to different stakeholders that have boots on the ground that know the site well. That could be either facility managers that work within your organization, or it could be if you outsource property management vendors, those would be the right people to start asking. And then moving into the next ranking of data, so level two, if you don't have any actual meters, then what you can do is um, obtain, say if you're the tenant, you would ask the landlord if they're willing to provide the total building energy usage, and then you can just calculate of the total building, how much area do you occupy, and then apply that number. Um, it's not perfect, of course, but it's better than having no available data. And then the third, looking at similar buildings, so say that you don't have either one or two options, but then you have similar buildings in a, a regional location, it could be like a nearby state or even in the same city, and you have actual data available for that other site, and you know that the usage patterns are the similar, um, people occupy the space around the same time, nine to five, it's another commercial office building, then you can use that data and apply it to the space that you don't have actuals for. And then lastly, if you don't have any of those available, then you would use the generic building industry benchmarks. Um, and really for steps two through three, those would all be a lot more, um, like someone could do it remotely. You don't necessarily need the involvement of someone that's on site. So it could be your sustainability team or a data analyst, um, whoever's helping you put together the overall carbon inventory would be good to do steps two through th two through four. Mm. Yeah, I think we found that 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 data collection process is 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 tricky, and you know it's not always fun, but it's it's crucial to get that that baseline right. Yeah, and a, a lot of companies will also outsource that to consultants like myself and have us fill all those gaps for them. So that's another option too, if you have mm -hmm. constrained resources in-house. Yeah, that's a good point. So I think, you know, once you once you collect that, that building level data, um, the next step is to then convert that energy metric into a carbon metric and, you know, you can do that by using the local um, grid emission factors to say what each building is is emitting in terms of its operational carbon right now. And I think that's that's really important. But I think also it's just as important to think about, well, if we do nothing and just rely on the grid to decarbonize over time, where might be in what where might we we end up after you know five, 10, 15 years of of grid decarbonization and um, that's something that we've been personally working on with with the carbon site tool is being able to think about those those business as usual scenarios and those projections over time and this is just an illustration of you know where you are now with this first dot and where you might end up even before you start thinking about how do we decarbonize this this asset just kind of over over time as as the grid cleans So step number three is all about setting targets. Um, I think understanding 
baseline emissions is, is a great and necessary first step, but it's not going to get us to where we need to, to go in terms of decarbonization. So, you know, we need to set targets and I think specifically smart carbon targets and i'm sure many of you have probably seen the smart acronym before but if you haven't I means specific measurable achievable relevant and time bound so you know for for specific you need to be able to say what are you, what exactly are you trying to accomplish as as part of this goal and with it being measurable you need to then actually know and verify when you've achieved it or um, if you've achieved it it needs to be achievable and like not completely like reaching for the stars it needs to be attainable and i think along that lines it, it should be relevant in terms of it aligning with your your company's long-term objectives so that those two are in in parallel rather than working against each other and then you know time bound because <laughs> this was one of the first things I, I learned as a consultant was that nothing happens without a deadline so you know you need to set a, a, a date on that and here's a couple of examples of just um what a what a smart target looks like on the left hand side and maybe what a uh, a not so smart target looks like on the right hand side there's a couple of different ways that you can set targets as well. One is the absolute approach and the other is an intensity-based approach. And so an absolute is really re setting a target that is a, a discrete amount. It's an absolute amount of emissions that you are trying to reduce. Whereas an intensity-based target is more about you know, reducing emissions per square foot or per dollar in revenue or per item produced. And they both have their, their pros and cons um, when we think about the absolute targets, the obvious benefit is that you're actually going to reduce emissions by a, a certain amount and it tackles the, the carbon crisis that, that we're all trying to, to tackle. Um, while, you know, like an intensity based target, you could set, you could say, I want to reduce, you know, 50% of my uh, emissions per square foot by 2030 but you could acquire 300% more assets between now and then, and your actual emissions may go up even though your emissions per square foot go down. Um, the benefit of an intensity-based approach though is that it doesn't restrict growth potential. So if you're a smaller business looking to grow over time, then maybe something like this would, would work better. And, and Nicolette, I'm again, like with the clients that you speak to on a daily basis, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on kind of this, this slide here. Yeah, I I think that well one thing that's key to mention is if you if you're a company that is setting a science-based target, SBTI only accepts intensity targets um, for uh, certain industries. So they develop sector-specific guidance that you know a bunch of professionals behind SBTI work together to create. And those are explicitly for hard to abate and for fast growing industries. And there's plenty of industries that they don't have that for. So if you are trying to set an SBTI, know that that is a limitation that you'll have to work within. Um, if you're not setting an SBTI, then that won't necessarily restrict you. But nowadays, SBTI is sort of, um, you know, the industry norm and that's what everybody's going for. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, the absolute targets are preferred by external parties and approval bodies because they're standardized, they're relatively relatively easy to assess um, in terms of like level of ambition and performance. And they're also just easier to communicate. Um, I see that oftentimes the intensity-based targets get translated into absolute terms just because it's easier for people to understand and conceptualize. Okay, yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought of like the, the communication part of the intensity based targets. So yeah, I think absolute is is the gold standard then. Yeah, for sure. So now we move on to you know step four, which is identifying the actual strategies to, to decarbonize. And so by this point, hopefully you're at a stage where you you understand how how much 
you are emitting and have some kind of idea of where you want to get to in terms of a, a reduction target. And now this is where you actually have to, to think about the kinds of things that you can do to reduce emissions. And when we're thinking about real estate and, and buildings, I think there are three key levers that you can pull um, at the building level to reduce emissions. And the first one is really around energy efficiency and conservation measures. So this might be, um, you know, reducing the energy use of the existing systems through commissioning, or it might be retrofitting um, to, to reduce the load of, of the building through things like um, LED upgrades, things of, of that nature. The second lever is about moving away from, from fossil fuels, fuel switching towards electrification. Because as the grid cleans, um, the, the electricity use um, in terms of carbon matters, matters less because it's going to get cleaner over time. So you know, switching away from, from gas and other fossil fuels to electricity. And then the last one is then decarbonizing that supply of energy through on-site solar or you know, green purchase agreements. So this is where you kind of have to think about like, where do you, where do you start? What, which buildings do you start? And where is the, the low hanging fruit to decarbonize? And um, I like this, this idea of a slice of watermelon is still bigger than a bunch of grapes because it puts into my mind, okay, I should focus on the biggest emitters first. Let's, let's tackle the, the top 10% of our portfolio to start with. And that's really going to make the biggest, the biggest dent. Um, you know, you've got to, you've got to start somewhere and it's sometimes hard to, to think about an entire portfolio. So being able to, to prioritize which buildings to start with, um, is, is important to, to kind of think about which, um, which resources to deploy. And I also think the 80, 20 rule here is probably a, a nice concept to think about as well. Um, because you know, when you're decarbonizing an individual asset, you might spend 20% of the effort getting the, the first big chunk of, of decarbonization out of the way, and then 80% of the effort trying to really get all of it uh, decarbonized. So I, I kind of think of these two principles when you're trying to prioritize which assets to, to start with first. And a, a way that I've tried to think about how to conceptualize this and visualize it is, you know, these two graphs on, on the screen here. The first one um, with the y-axis being energy use intensity and the uh, x-axis here being, you know, gross floor area or size of the asset. And so if you have the energy use and you have the size, you can kind of start to, to create a, a bit of a, a matrix as to where your high priority assets to focus on might be. These are probably the ones that are going to have the highest carbon and to really start to, to prioritize. If you already know how much carbon each asset emits, then maybe this type of chart on the right hand side might be better where you can start to rank order which ones are the biggest emitters. And um, you know, Nicolette, I know that there are other things to, to think about when prioritizing which assets to, to decarbonize. And I'm sure you've got some some interesting kind of tidbits to share here. Yeah, there's a few different ways that we go about it. And it, it kind of, it ultimately depends on the client's priorities, but oftentimes the, the biggest um, criteria that we look at are energy use intensity, of course, carbon use intensity, which factors in the cleanliness of the grid, as well as how much natural gas is used on site. And then we also take a look at if, I'm representing a tenant, the lease duration, uh, because if, if you're gonna be leaving the space in the next two years, it probably doesn't make sense to invest a lot of money in energy efficiency upgrades. Mm. Um, we look at data confidence as well. So if a site is submetered and we know that all that data is accurate, it has higher confidence, we know we can calculate the savings with greater reliability. If it's estimated data, then we not only aren't sure about the data, but we aren't able to quantify the savings afterwards unless we install a meter on site before we do any upgrades. 
Um, and then lastly, we also look at the level of control of the space. So again, if, if you're representing a tenant or even on the landlord side, um, you might not have full access to all of the energy systems that are supporting the space. So the tenant might not have access to the base building equipment and a landlord might not have access to some of the tenant equipment. So those are all things that you want to take into consideration. And we've built some pretty fun calculators that factor in all of these different criteria and then rank sites based on all of them. Um, and we can weight differently, like which criteria are the most important. Usually the carbon use intensity is top criteria. And then from there, we look at the top sites with key stakeholders, talk about how much it would cost to implement different upgrades, um, do energy audits on the site to uncover different energy conservation measures, and then ultimately um, coordinate with the different stakeholders that own budget to build the budget in during budgeting season and then plan for any projects in the upcoming year. Mm. And I suppose kind of what we were talking about earlier about risks as well could factor into one of those quite like those criteria for, for ranking to say, okay, this asset is, um, you know, in a jurisdiction that's got a new regulation coming down the line or is going to be at, at risk of having a high penalty. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Lots of things to consider. And there's a lot of talk about electrification these days and clients are worried about the implications of electrification regulations and wanting to do feasibility studies in advance of any of those laws coming into effect. So that, you know, like planning ahead, as you said before, making sure that you're not scrambling at the end to try to meet the regulations and instead you're thinking about it well in advance. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of leads on to, onto this next section nicely, which is, is starting to think about feasibility and um, I think before you, you dive into a detailed decarbonization plan for an individual asset, it would probably be a, a good idea to start thinking about like a high level strategy and pulling these different levers by saying, okay, if I were to bucket my different priority assets into, into various typologies, and then, you know, say, if I were to reduce my electricity use or my natural gas use by X percent, how far will that get me to my my target and then that forming kind of the the strategy from which to to then you know add, add meat to the bones and and some detail around it um but kind of nicolette to what you were just saying there i think the next step ultimately where you want to get to is is coming up with a let's call it a, a universe of of measures that could be employed or deployed rather on a on each building um, and you were talking about kind of doing energy audits i think it's important that yeah you that's where you need to be able to engage with a, a technical team that has that on the ground expertise to to do energy audits um, and that's not always possible to do it on all of your buildings and again in the companion guide we we talk about energy audits but we also talk about some of the alternatives that you can use um, in addition to energy audits if you know, you're a bit more budget constrained or you have way too many assets to, to do an energy audit on. But really, ultimately, you want to get to a place where for each of your, your buildings, you've got a list of, of potential decarbonization measures. And for each of those, you want to know how much energy is being reduced by each of them, what year it would be implemented, how much it might cost to, to implement, and any maintenance costs or savings associated with that, um, any incentives, any penalties, things of that nature, what the utility savings would be, and ultimately what that that change in in carbon would be as well. And that's you know, it's difficult to organise and, and do all of those those calculations. And again, just with what we're trying to do with with the carbon site tool is offer a space for teams and, and building owners to organise a lot of this energy efficiency measure data and uh, speed up the calculation of how much carbon would be saved and what that return on investment of each of those measures are. So here's just kind of a, a snapshot of, of what that one of those pages looks like, where you can start to create different decarbonization measures within the tool and specify a lot of that information that, that we were just talking about there. I also wanted to touch on 
on this slide here about, I think it's important to think about one options and two timing. Um, I think a lot of people want to, to get to this like net zero state, but it can often be difficult to, to pass that financial barrier or that hurdle, um, especially when you're thinking about, can we do it now? Like how much would, assist, how much would it cost to do this now? And that might just be a non-starter straight away. But when you think about comparing it to a like-for-like -like system at the end of its useful life, that might actually turn out to be a much um, easier business case to make because the delta between the two might be a lot less. And when you factor in incentives, factor in penalties, factor in utility savings, you know, this might actually flip in, in the net zero uh, states like favor. And it might actually be a, a good financial decision as well as an environmental one. So step four was all about kind of creating all of the different possibilities to decarbonize. Step five is now thinking, how do I actually create a prioritized plan of action? Because you know, you're not gonna be able to do every single measure that was potentially um, suggested for every building. So you need to be able to come up with a cost-effective, budget-friendly plan of action. And there are a few things to, to consider here. I think location is, is definitely a, a big one. You know, each location will have its own grid emission factors now and utility costs now, but also how they're going to change in the future. Each one of those locations is going to have a different path to grid cleaning, different utility rate um, fluctuations, and all of that, you know, really does affect the, the return on investment or the, the cost effectiveness of, of strategies. Um, sequencing is also a big one. Um, Nicolette and her team know this way better than me, but you know, some measures can only be done once other measures have already been put in place. And so I think working with a technical team that knows the theories and the sequence of what strategies and what measures can be done within a building um, is, is really valuable. And then, you know, return on investment. Don't just think of the upfront cost. Think of what those lifetime savings, what the penalties, the incentives, how will that really um, affect the total cost of ownership or the return on investment of, of each of those, those different strategies? Um, again, this is just a, a screenshot of the, the carbon site prioritization page where you can start to build a roadmap and pick and choose which strategies make the most sense based on you know, lifetime savings versus carbon versus upfront costs and being able to think about when you would apply each of these measures. So it gives you a way to maybe um, have a flexible way to, to pick and choose and build a roadmap that actually fits within your budget, but can then also hit the, the targets that you've set. And then ultimately, once you build a roadmap, what you can then do is visualize it. And so here, what you're seeing is just um, a building specific decarbonization roadmap where you can start to see what the, the business as usual pathway would be for this asset versus what the roadmap would look like, that green line. And you can see which levers have the most impact. You can look at scope one versus scope two emissions. Um, you can then get a sense of like the energy usage of that asset as well as the financial impacts as well. So you can really start to speak the language of the people who, who hold the purse strings to say, this is how much we're going to be spending, but this is how much we're going to be saving in return over the, the next like, capital planning cycle. So I think this is an important way to, to then like visualize and really just adapt a plan around uh, a set budget. Lastly, or not lastly, rather, step six, um, is about implementation and adapting the plan. So um, I think Nicolette kind of touched on this a little bit before, but you do want to build that business case um, so that 
you know, the, the plan of action gets built into the capital plan and then ultimately it can then get implemented. So I think there are a bunch of different stakeholders that you need to, to be able to engage um, as part of this process, including building managers, you know, the facilities teams, the, the Stokes of the world, like the consultants that you're working with um, to really like now get this plan that's on a bit of paper or in a, in a dashboard into action. And um, yeah, Nicola, I'd be curious what your thoughts are on, on kind of like implementation. Yeah, the, the way that we've seen this play out is so, for example, after you've you've sort of identified from the different projects, whether it's energy audits, um, monitoring based commissioning, retro commissioning, uh, electrification feasibility studies, sub metering, battery storage, there's all these different projects that you can implement to then see like, OK, these are the options available on the table. And you can see what the potential emission savings and return on investment is, um, as well as what the capital immediate capital costs are going to be if there are any. And that's really when you need to sit down with all of the key decision makers and talk about it as a group because you don't want to do it in a silo and then tell people like this is what you need to build into your budget. This is what we're doing because then it's it's just not gonna be effective. Everyone wants to feel like they understand why the decisions are being made and also be able to make the decision on their own if it affects um, their business unit or their building, whatever it might be. So we've what we've tried to do is bring in um, stakeholders from like those you have mentioned here, also the transactions team, the people who, the brokers who do the deals on new buildings so that they understand what we're looking for in new buildings and why we might choose one building over another. Um, you also wanna bring in, of course, the corporate sustainability team if there is one so that they understand what's happening at the real estate level. And um, then of course, like the consultants are always key. And I think, really getting all of those opinions together um there's there's new perspectives that emerge when you have all the teams that are explaining from their standpoint what's the most important or why something should be budgeted for that's maybe more expensive than um something that is a cheaper option you know you have to take into account like what's already failing in the building did they already have certain upgrades planned and now you can sort of like capitalize on that planned upgrade to couple it with something else um so kind of going to the sequencing that you spoke of simon mm. but yeah i think in general just making sure that all the stakeholders are together and you're coordinating on both the capital expenditure budgets and the operating expenditure budgets makes the whole plan a lot more successful. Yeah, and, and I don't know if you can speak to this, like the capital budget versus the operational budgets. Do you ever find that there is like a, a good cohesion or is it, are they, do they not really speak to each other much? That's a good question. I, I would say it really depends on the company. Um, for larger companies, it seems that they tend to be more siloed, but for smaller companies, they tend to be talking to each other a lot more. Mm. Um, so I I think we've, for some of the larger scale clients that I work for, um, we've started as the sustainability team, encouraging that overlap and that dialogue to happen because there's often like tax benefits to coupling something into OPEX versus CAPEX. Um, mm. Sometimes it just makes more sense for the company's financial situation and their budget planning for one given year. But if they're not having those conversations, then they might spend in one of the categories where it ends up costing the company more money and they can't explore municipal or government funding opportunities. So I, I always encourage that dialogue wherever possible. Yeah. And then I guess like with the building managers, those are the people that really know what's happening in the building. They know, OK, this is feasible. This isn't because we're doing this this year or, you know, it's just not realistic. Or we we already upgraded the LEDs like three years ago, whatever it might be. So I think that's yeah. a good point to, to to bring up that like these these folks will have the information that you might not have. And getting them all in a room is is valuable. Yeah, and also the other relationship that's really key is the person who owns the relationship between 
the landlord or tenant, depending which side you're on. If you're the if you're the landlord having a good relationship with the tenant, or if you're the tenant having a good relationship with the landlord, can also be a breaking point as to whether you would or wouldn't implement an energy efficiency project, mm. um, because it might be that you are you kind of need to like enroach on one of the other parties' systems. And if you don't have a good relationship, then it might not be worthwhile to implement that project. But if you do have a good relationship and they're willing to partner with you, um, then it's it could make more sense than another site. So those yeah. are all things that you want to factor into the decision making. Maybe this will come up in the Q&A, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, maybe later, if there's if there's time, I'd be interested to explore that a bit further in terms of like cost sharing or how that partnership can can work. So maybe we can we can circle back around on on that that later sounds good um so i think a couple of points on 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 this slide really is i think um you know as, as you do implement measures make sure if you've if you can like you know check it off on on your plan to to say if you're on on track to meet your targets yeah we did this this and this last year um or we we didn't manage to get to to these ones so we're we're behind um, I think the other one is basically, you know, things are changing all the time and that renders a plan of action basically like out of date by the time it's out of the, the printer or, or it's, you know, sent in, into your email box because budget might change, um, you know, utility rates are always changing, emission factors are, are changing. So I think having a, a way to be able to to revisit and adapt your plan of action is is really important, and that's why you know, I always um, advocate for having an online dashboard. Excel is great for certain things, but can be a bit messy for for things for for updating and um, staying on top of like changes. So um, important to to update. So almost at the end here in terms of the steps. So track and report progress is step number seven, and you know, there's a there's a bunch of, of ESG tracking tools and reporting tools out there. Um, I've listed a bunch in the companion guide, so you can you can look at those. You can also use Carbon Site as a way to to track progress by adding in historical data, um, reporting. The alphabet soup of of different reporting protocols are, are here as well, more in the reports, and then just you know definitely important to to share both successes and where you you have room for improvement and neglect again like you do this more than me so definitely keen to hear your perspective here yeah i think i i won't get into any of the reporting because that could be its whole own webinar mm -hmm. but i think in general just emphasizing the importance of um tracking and communicating both progress against the corporate sustainability goals but also the smaller team or department or business unit goals is equally as important because then it helps everyone really stay connected to both the bigger picture and the smaller scale wins because um, sometimes the bigger picture progress is very small and incremental and so it can be like a little bit discouraging or seem disappointing but if you track to the smaller goals as well it it just helps you remind you that you know each each project that you implement does have a big difference. Um, so those those have been some successful tactics, just making sure to focus on the big and little. And then um, just emphasizing what you have at the bottom here, the transparency and um, not only communicating wins, but also communicating what's not working well, um, any like gaps or um, things that you are asking your team or leadership team to help with because then you know that honesty really has an impact and people will want to get involved and they're more likely to open up and offer support yeah i think that's a really really valuable um comment there um so step eight is is really a, a cheat step as i mentioned at the beginning it's it's more just okay you've go past go and do it all again because i think Doing decarbonization planning is not necessarily just a once and done exercise. I think it is something that is a, a continual process that needs to be adapted and and continued 
over time. So when we go back to the eight steps, uh, they're, they're there on the screen. I won't um, go into them again, but you can, you can take a look in your own time. And then a reminder, the handout is, is in the, the uh, GoToWebinar uh, little handout section, or you can actually go to our website and get it there and take a look at some other stuff on, on the website, including demos. I know we've got maybe 10 minutes for, for questions here. Um, for ones that we don't get to in the chat, I think we'll probably um, follow up via email. So definitely throw a question into the Q&A box. But if you want to reach out to either me or Nicolette directly as well, feel free to, and you can um, I'm going to take a screenshot of, of this slide and get our email addresses. So yeah, I just want to say thank you for um, listening to the webinar and look forward to answering some questions. All right. Well, terrific. Thanks a lot for that presentation. It was uh, very informative. Uh, we do have a few questions coming in. Um, so let's go ahead and get right to those. Um, getting some from uh, email and some through the app. But again, if you want to ask a question, go ahead and type that into the box provided in the in the uh, app. Um, question number one, uh, regarding the regulatory pressure to decarbonize, are these usually at the state level or local? And then um, other than California, what states are requiring decarbonization? Um, I'll just comment very briefly and Nicolette, I'll, I'll pass it to you as well because I'm sure you've got some, some good stuff on that. But it, I think it really, it depends. Like you've got places like uh, New York City, so not New York State that have, that's got local law 97. So you've got individual cities that are requiring building energy performance standards. You've got other cities, I think, um, either Seattle, I think, um, there are some that are coming through in, in Colorado, others in California as well. And there's a great website. I think the Institute for Market Transformation has a really nice infographic that has all of the different local or state carbon or energy performance goals as it relates to buildings. I think there's also um, something either from NREL or the EPA on if you type in building energy performance standards. Um, then you can you can find kind of a list of which cities and states are, are implementing those. All right. Yeah, that's a perfect answer. There's I, I don't have them all memorized by heart either, but yeah, they they vary from city and state level, and then soon it will be federal as well. Okay. Uh, next question: uh, Local grid emission factors you mentioned. Um, so where do we get this, and is there a standard way of reporting it? Um, Nicola, I don't know if you want to go first, but I'm happy to. If... I can, sure, I can hop in. So um, companies do use different emissions factors in the U.S. I would say the most prevalent one that I see my clients using is the eGrid. Um, you can access those emissions factors online. I think I think there is a fee. I don't remember off the top of my head what the fee is. Uh, and then for international, there's also different data sets. IEA is a common one. Um, so those are all ex accessible data sets online, but I do believe you have to pay. Yeah, you, I think you do have to pay for that international data set because that's the one that we use within CarbonSite because we've got, I think, data now for about 130 countries for, for emission factors. So I think, yeah, that one you do have to pay for. And we also use, I think, the, the e grid data from the EPA for the US locations as well. So that has, yeah, for each region, what the, the current emission factors are. And then what we do is we use the energy outlook data from the EIA, not to be confused with the IEA, to say how those grids are gonna change over time. So the EIA is the Energy uh, Information Administration. I think it's like the US um, compatriot to the EPA. Okay. Next question. Um, could you describe the EC, I'm sorry, the ESCO financing models, especially uh, the one where the owner does not need to pay up front capital costs? Can the cost to retrofit be offset by a long-term utility cost savings? 
The biggest challenge we face is that we don't have the capital upfront to undertake uh, greenhouse gas reduction projects. Nicola, I'll, I'll, I have an answer as well, but I'll, I'll let you kind of chime in first if you if you have something to, to say first. I'll, I'll let you take this one. Go for it. Okay. Um, we so we do actually have a a recent um, partnership with a a company called Correlate Inc. and that's the, the exact business model that that they they use to approach this because we have found that you know, many building owners don't have that upfront cost to um, to really like get started and to to cover the the implementation costs of putting in a decarbonization plan, not just the planning side of things, but the actual like um, hardware to to decarbonize. And so that's the model that that they're using. They're basically offering a free upfront cost, like no upfront cost plan to decarbonize and using the utility savings as a way to kind of get the, the payback. So they own the, the utility savings while offering the owner a zero upfront cost way to decarbonize. And they're actually yeah, going to be using our tool as the, the planning tool. And then they're the ones kind of doing the financing implementation side of things. Okay. Uh, next question. The most difficult part of the journey is often electrification. Uh, what do what are you finding and what are what is the ROI? How difficult is it? And do you see many large commercial building owners doing it? I can I can hop in with I think I'll I'll answer the question maybe in reverse. So um, I only see really big players that are investing in this right now. Um, I think that it's top of mind. It's being talked about across all sectors, but I've, I've seen a lot of clients do feasibility studies and then ultimately determine that they're not ready for it. Um, the finances just aren't panning out quite yet, but some of the really big players that are progressive and have the available funds are investing in it now sort of to like talking about that reputation that we did in the beginning like owning their reputation and wanting to showcase that they're a leader um the roi is it's it, it depends building by building you know every building is a different age it depends like what kind of combustion equipment is present um how many years left does that equipment have so it's not something that you can just cookie cutter say like it's always feasible and has a good return on investment or always doesn't um, you really do have to unfortunately do a feasibility study for every individual building to determine the case yeah and i think that's where cities can play a part as well where they they seem to be the ones almost like taking the the brunt to begin with and creating the market for some of these um, all electric systems and um, doing bulk purchases as well to to try and reduce that that average cost for, for some of these systems but yeah Nicola that's absolutely right okay next question uh, when prioritizing the watermelon over the grapes uh, what is your experience with selecting hybrid fuel switching projects when all electric fuel switching isn't immediately feasible in the near term, but uh, would bring a good deal of a greenhouse gas reduction uh, as compared to project of smaller uh, savings potential, um, even if fully electrified? Nicolette, I'm going to be honest, I, I probably don't have the the, uh, the know-how to answer that one. So if, if you can take it, please do. I, to be honest, I think I, I think you need to reread the question. I'm kind of confused exactly sure. what the question is stating. Yeah, it's just kind of asking, what's your experience with selecting hybrid fuel switching projects uh, when all electric fuel switching isn't immediately feasible? Ah, uh, okay. 
Um, so that would be something I personally could not answer, but my engineering team has done this exact evaluation and they, they have the expertise to answer that. So whoever asked that question, if you want to follow up with me via email, I can connect you to some folks that would be able to answer that for you. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like uh, it is uh, the top of the hour, so we have run out of time. Um, but if we didn't have a chance to get to your particular question, go ahead. Though there will be a survey that pops up at the uh, conclusion of the webinar, and you can go ahead and ask your question there, and we'll certainly get back to you. Um, so, I, uh, Simon and Nicolette, once again, thanks a lot for an excellent presentation, and uh, I want to thank. Uh, carbon side at AutoCase um, for making this webinar possible. Um, so Simon and Nicolette, any parting thoughts before we log off? I think just get started. Get get like a, a plan of action started. You know, just have a playbook ready. And even if you don't implement everything or any of it, just you know, at least you have have a plan of action for when you need it. Yeah, that's a great parting statement. And I would add to that. Don't worry if you don't have perfect data because nobody does. So don't let that be a deterrent to getting started. You figure it out mm -hmm. along the way and improve it along the way. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, that'll do it, folks. Um, see you next time. We'll uh, have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.